okay for recording? Okay, on the cell phone? I guess so? Okay. All right, so um, uh, if people aren't, you know, just a very, a, a very high level plug is an application. Um, it has does a lot of stuff out of the box. <clears throat> so what I wanted to talk about is, uh, in our experience of sort of putting Plone in, in, in fairly large production environments, some of the problems that we've had, and sort of actually this, this talk doesn't have that much to do with Pyth Plone, really. It's gonna be sort of just general Python things, because Python uh, has some sort of, uh, uh, some fairly sort of limita limitations inside of the language that you kind of just have to know about. Uh, or you might shoot yourself in the foot. And, uh, right, so let me just get on with it. Um, so, Plone really is sort of this general purpose application. You can download it, it like runs on Windows and, and Linux, and you can go on cloud.org and grab your Plone site and, and all that, and it works like really quite good. You know, I mean, it, it, it does something. And since it's general purpose, sort of scaling, sc this sort of scaling talk that I'm talking about is not really scaling the application because essentially an application like this can't scale. Right? I mean, this, the, the, the amount of decisions that have been made for it, you're, going to, you're simply not going to be able to write something uh, with one million concurrent users with Plone, right? And that's just a fact. You will not be able to write a one million concurrent user system with anything that is not custom from scratch, period. So, now that we have that out of the way, uh, the, the, the issue with scaling in Plone is that you have to think you have to think in context of the application. You have to sort of say, okay, what is the strengths and weaknesses of the application, the environment, and you have to sort of play to those strengths. Um, an example, right, would be uh, user-generated content. You know, you do not need to have user-generated content really stored inside of Plone. You sort of have your own user-generated content library thing, like Discuss, I think, has shown everyone how user-generated content is supposed to work, and you sort of, you know, dangle it off your URL or some sort of UID, and you can go very fast, right, because that part is, is optimized for writes. Uh, and then we all solve the, the read load problem of Varnish and, and all those kinds of things. But obviously that's a, that's a crutch. I'll talk about, uh, about not, not actually doing that. So in other words, I guess, you, can, you can't just add nodes to Plone and just expect it to just randomly scale. At least out of the box, it certainly won't do this. And there's sort of a competition we have between ease of use out of the box and scale. Right? And so what we do is, you know, the, the defaults that we have are for ease of use and for someone to be wowed by it. And it works very well. I mean, a lot of people just sort of install it, use it, and that's, that's good enough, right? Maybe we'll have lots of themes and, and, and people will sort of be able to pick a theme and, and they'll download clone, pick a theme, and then just be happy with it, right? And that would be sort of the next, like, three months, I think, we can have something like that. Uh, but in, in, in general, you sort of have two patterns of it. One which is sort of editorialization of, of content, the people who use the CMS, and the people who consume content from the CMS, right? I mean, this, is, this isn't a general purpose, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, very sort of specific application, and this are, these are the two sort of main modes. Um, and, and then sort of when, 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 we're, when we're looking at sort of volume, we have to sort of really think about it in the context of the application. If you do not think about it in, in the context of the application, you start to start asserting your own opinions about it, sort of how things are supposed to work or whatever, you know, laws of physics in your world, the, the fact is that it's a general application and, and the application is going to work the way it is designed to work and that's just how it is. You know, you're, just, you're not going to be able to beat it into submission. So a quick overview of the stack, we have Linux or Windows, uh, Python 2.6, uh, ZODB, those kinds of things. And most, most importantly, we sort of have some sort of thing that is taking a request from the browser and sticking it on some sort of node or some sort of worker process. And all these things work really well. Mod whiskey works very well. Mod proxy kind of works if you want to deal with processes, but mod whiskey is my favorite. And of course, IIS, you can, you can still use that. All right, so when you're actually building a Plone project and you actually need to have some sort of scale, it would be very, very, very wise of you to either pick the most recent version or the one that's coming up, right? Because one of the problems that people have is, you know, open source is not 
commercial software. It, this is not um, software that like comes with a warranty or or comes with a quality a ter a terms and conditions. I mean, you have to be very smart about what you're picking, and really, what you're picking is where am I going to land when my project lands, right? So I can't deploy if I have to, if I'm doing something fairly sophisticated. I can't actually necessarily use the technology today because the technology that's coming down the pipeline, which I have to actually know about, I have to sort of, you know, my project's going to end in six months, so I need to like figure out where I'm going to land in six months, not look back today, right? So if there's like a, an alpha version of Plone or, or a beta version of Plone, you really want to sort of use that one in the beginning of development. That way you can be really aggressive about your, your you, you pushing the system and, and, and you can control the, the things inside of Plone if it's still in development. Once it goes out of development, it's a hell of a lot harder to get to get things back into the system. So things that we're talking about: uh, build out, Mr. Developer, uh, Firebug, um, the templating engine. Uh, it, it, uh, using 5.pt is 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 very important uh, for a host of reasons. Not only because it's faster, but mainly because it gets the noise out of the profiler. Uh, if you're looking at a profile with a Zook page template, it's just noise, and you cannot read it, right? So just you install 5PT, it works. We use it on every project. And not only does your system go faster, but you have no noise inside your profiles, right? So that's like a must, must do. Zook.profiler, wherever it lands, we have a fork of it and sitting inside of our PyPy. You guys can use it. Uh, Collective.stats uh, was in fold stats, but some people uh, copied it, and that's sitting inside of... Uh, PyPy, that's actually very important because what it actually does is inside of Firebug or inside the server side, you can actually see like how many objects were loaded per request, how much of the cache miss, and how much objects stored, and total time in traversal, total time in requests, you know, inside the actual publisher. And it's it if you don't use that, you're actually, I mean, you have to have some kind of insight on what's going on, right? If you don't have insight, you're going to be it's just a, a, a black box, right? Blindfolded. Me. Huh? You're blindfolded. Yeah, you're blindfolded. It's just you're sort of hoping it's working right. And um, and this, you just simply can't do that nowadays, right? All this stuff is very, it, 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 I mean, timelines are compressed. You, you, you have to roll out production stuff, and, and you simply don't have the the time to uh, to learn about the, the, the behavior of the, pro the, the product in, in production, right? It has to be done way before. And really, one of the big problems with Zope and, 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 and Plone, specifically, that our tooling is very underweight, right? I mean, we're really underweight in tooling, and this is kind of a problem, maybe with Python in general, but it's a it's a problem nonetheless. And tooling, I think, is kind of a very important thing for everyone to think about. All right, so the first number, the first number, the first thing we do when we're when we're trying to talk about scale, at least in the editorial side, is we just don't do the work, right? So like, we just defer work. Things that are very uh, uh, CPU intensive, things like indexing in the catalog. This is a very, very, very sophisticated, very, very CPU intensive uh, 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 CPU and write intensive uh, uh, operation. So we just defer it, right? We like do not do it inside the same request. So there's a number of things to do it inside of Plone. There's EC async, which we wrap with Plone app, uh, uh, which Plone app async came out of it. And um, it works, right? So like what you would defer is something like the catalog call, right? Integrating this into Plone proper is a little bit more complicated because it requires even more policy. And anyway, if you look at it, you can imagine you know, shipping software with this for the general population might be a little bit difficult. But you have a worker that actually just consumes a queue and, and does work. Um, it's, been in used for several, it's been used for several years. We used it for, a, a, for about OCRing about 500,000 documents. OCR is a great example of, of, of sort of deferred and, and, and CPU bound problems. And this scales really well, right? You just like push a node in and like the CPU goes and you know, it's just, you know, you put another node in and, and you just keep plugging nodes in and they're all like just doing work and you, you can, you know, it's a CPU bound problem. Really, really fantastic for, uh, for deferring work. Uh, some problems with, with, with async, uh, it polls. Uh, that's not a problem, but don't try to make it real time by like in decreasing the polling to like 0 .001. That's just not how the system works. Um, you cannot opt out of transactions. If you if you have any doubt that you need transactions, just do, you don't you don't want transactions. You can't use this, right? It's either all or you're all or nothing, right?
right? It's, it's, you know, if you're going to use it, use, uh, you have to use transactions. Uh, and then the task queue might have a UI, uh, UI problem if your job result actually generates a binary. If you click on the button, then you might actually see there's a binary. Anyway, I was trying to get a little bit faster. The other, the other, ooh, my computer's freaking out. Um, the other issue with, the other flip side of this is actually a message queue, which are becoming uh, quite popular. MQ series has probably existed for at least 20 years. Uh, this is sort of a normal pattern inside of like the enterprise. And I think the reason why it didn't make it inside of any other open source technology is because probably there was not a free one that wasn't Java or something. Uh, Java's had it for quite some, quite, quite, quite some time. We, inter we integrated uh, MSMQ, Microsoft's message queue inside of Zope 2. And sort of the kinds of message queues that we're talking about are things like Beanstalk D, which is like a really, really trivial one. RabbitMQ, which is a sophisticated one, I've heard very good things and very bad things about it. So you, you need to sort of do some thinking before you use Rabbit. And Redis, which is actually written in C, and that's quite, quite nice for us Python guys. And, uh, and it's actually a little bit more than just a message queue. It kind of does some caching, and, and it's kind of seemingly the winner, maybe? I don't know. But it, Redis seems to be the thing to use when, when, when you're trying to do message queues. And zero MQ, just FYI, is not a message queue. It's just about transport. All right. Come on. Um, all right, so let's see. What else? I don't know. I don't have my prompt to actually tell me. Ah, there we go. Look at that. My computer is being scanned for viruses, I'm sure. All right, so app caching. In, uh, in the ZUDB, you sort of get application caching for free. I, this everyone. Who here knows that the ZUDB has a cache that gets invalidated when you write things? No? Okay, well, there's a whole lot of stuff inside of Zope that actually does a lot of work for you transparently. And if you try to go and use a relational database, you will have a very, very different performance characteristic than you have with Zope. Zope does some really nice things for you just automatically. And you just simply cannot solve that problem with relational protocols, right? You can use queues to invalidate, but Zope just sort of does this. And there's a huge amount of value that we kind of get and we kind of, we don't really recognize Zope for the, some of the value. Zope 2 caches aren't terribly good. Beaker is, is sort of the Python thing. I don't know what Django guys use, but in, in Pyramid and Whiskey world, sort of Beaker's kind of what you get. Uh, collective Beaker is a, is a Zope integration into it. Just to watch out, don't use the file system cache. It's very, very naive. Like, really naive, as in, like, it will take out your entire site. It is, presumably, you think this stuff is good, right? It, like, smells good, like, people use it. And then you, you, and then you actually, oh, well, surely I just, like, just put some pickles on the file system. How hard is this? And it just, like, completely takes out your site, right? So, I mean, Beaker works quite well in mem cache mode or maybe the relational mode, but, like, file system mode is, is miserable. Sessions, try to avoid them. And um, if you're sharing st state, then, you know, hey, the ZUDB actually works pretty well. Maybe not the ZUDB that you're actually working in, but you can mount another one in and use it as a cache. Uh, and that works pretty well. Computer. All right, so I think the next one is, is it really traffic signal? Okay, so another optimization way is to just sort of se separate your, uh, your traffic. This is pretty straightforward. I, I mean, I anyone who talks about sort of scaling things, is, this is sort of like normal stuff. But gets inside of Plone, should, so gets should never have side effects. In Plone, there is one git that I know of that causes a side effect, and we like are trying to fix that. Um, and so what you can do is you can actually uh, route and, and segregate traffic based on all my gets go to a stupid pool, and my posts can go to something fairly smart, maybe. And then what's interesting is if you sort of route posts in some way, like in Plone, we do a fairly interesting thing. If you route posts, you won't get conflict errors, depending on where you're doing sort of writes. Um, Mod Whiskey will help you with this sort of uh, segregation because you can, inside the Whiskey pipeline, you can compute like, oh, this person I'm going to send to this process based on this verb, right? It's like very, very simple, like Whiskey stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's exactly what sort of we, what you want to do. Um, and so, and we, and we use it in plot. All right, so now here's a, here's a delivery pattern that kind of scales very well, and we use it in our government agencies, right? So. What you have is you have a DMZ, and I'm sorry I don't have graphics. You have a DMZ, the DMZ has, has some sort of load balancing cache solution, and uh, you have workers, right? 
and the workers are only in read only. It is not possible in these government agencies for the, the, the public system to have any kind of right or any sort of database right on it at all, right? Like they're just saying no, you know, it, it's, you just simply cannot hack these systems, right? Because you can't write to them. So, you, and, and that's sort of a, a you know, it's, that's why static HTML works really well for the government. So what these things do are they in read only mode, they're running clone processes, and they sort of listen to, say, MySQL, like rail storage, let's say, right? Or it could be kind of like CO if you wanted to. But let's just say, in, my, in our case, we use rail storage. So you have, the two no, you have two or three nodes that are dispatching, pro, dispatching requests, and they're reading from um, MySQL slaves, right? You have multiple MySQL slaves inside the DMZ, right? And they can't take any sort of writes either, right? Well, you're blocking it both at the, at the, at the ZUDB level and then and you block it at MySQL level. Then inside of the internal network, you basically route your replication up into the, the DMZ from the internal. So you have a master, a slave, and then you have two slaves that's sitting inside the, the DMZ. And so your replication sort of just works, you know, like exactly how like replication is supposed to work. It's very simple, it's asynchronous, and you can make it synchronous if you want. It's, it's, what's actually the best part about this is that since it's like MySQL and it works the way that MySQL works, like operations guys can handle it and when it breaks, they can like figure out themselves like why it's breaking or what the replication problem is or all those kinds of things. But again, the internal side has a, a, a very different profile, right? It's for, it's for editorial control. It's for actually like doing all sorts of work. There may be sort of extra UI services and, and, and they certainly probably have like Active Directory integrated, maybe automatic login or all sorts of like kind of interesting facilities that to ease the editorial, you know, pain that people are working on and you can make it quite efficient. And in this way, any in this sort of configuration, we've d done this several times, it's completely fault tolerant, right? I mean, essentially, you can copy this and and put you know two no a whole other sub subnet and route things in such a way that you can you can just sort of like build out the redundancy. And so, no matter what, it's sort of fault tolerant, and, and, and this is like kind of something that the PHP and MySQL guys have been doing for like 10 years or something. So MySQL sort of just does this, and if you piggyback on it, you get it for free. All right, so cloud.org, an example of this is that each site, like say site name.cloud.org, gets stuck to a worker. And then since we only have one site and one and one process, one worker, like you just don't get conflict errors, right? I mean, you have, you're, you're dealing with one thread and, and just it's not possible. So it's, and and if, if you're paying money, we just sort of spin up multiple workers and then we segregate gets and posts and those kinds of things. And ModWhiskey has a very nice feature which will recycle based on RAM utilization. And it kind of will like bring up another site and. Do, do, do some really nice things to like prevent service uh, interruption. And now what happens is that our Travis, now, now we sort of shifted the problem. So our traffic segregation routing problem is actually kind of complicated, but like our actual entire infrastructure is very simple, right? And that is okay, right? I mean like, as long as you only have one thing that's fairly complicated that you have to deal with, it's a hell of a lot better than like making the complexity all over the place, right? And so that, that I think is a very important uh, idea in sort of scaling anything. So some of the bad defaults that will prevent scaling in Plone is, well, like, not using page, using not using 5.pt. The navigation menu scales horribly. Uh, it actually gets worse as, like, your graph gets bigger. Um, and it's just slow. So, like, there's several different alternatives, and, and using those, are, but they don't have the features, and the features are why it's slow. And so we go into this, this sort of, you know, you don't get your features, and you don't get scale, right? So, like, you have to pick one of them. And that's just sort of a fact of life. Uh, the green bars is right for optimization, and it's a great look, like if you want to look at like how not to do things, the green bar in Plone is exactly how not to do anything. So it supports a, a poor usage of the component architecture and a terrible usage of API design. Sort of like punting on the design and just letting the component architecture do it. It's an ter absolutely terrible idea. Um, but you should look at it because that's not, that's exactly how you do not program, right? And it's certainly how, not how you scale, right? You do everything up front, right? You design, you bootstrap. When your process starts, it needs to be fast. Uh, Python threads, in the ZUDB, relational databases are a little bit different because we sort of are sort of IO bound. In a, a fairly well-functioning uh, uh, ZOOP worker, you're going to be CPU bound. That's the side effect of the ZUDB cache and the fact that you're not doing very much IO stuff. And, and that's, a, that's sort of a, a profile, an application profile that is normal to the, the, the Plone and ZOOP world. It is very different in a data in a relational database application. You do not have this perform. You do not have these kinds of characteristics, right? You're actually waiting on I/O, or you're like you're waiting on doing stuff. 
which means you, you know, threads are, are a little bit, you know, you may have to increase threads and, and Python doesn't really do a good job with that. 32-bit uh, versus 64-bit. 64 64-bit, 64 you, you, you sort of have a heavier footprint, but you won't run into memory errors. Memory errors actually are the, are just the, not, not problems you want to have in production. So, you know, either you keep your working set, you know, you design your working set so it's not going to increase past the anywhere near uh, 1.5 uh, gigabytes, or you just punt and use 64-bit and just pay the, the RAM price. So one of the problems that we kind of have done, and it's interesting, but it's kind of time for us to stop doing it, is we've been crutch, crutching ourselves with varnish and, and reverse caches. And this is a really big problem. So, 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 and, and I'm, I'm sure I'm, I, I'm sure I probably contributed to some of this, but it's not a good idea to just sort of like assume that varnish is going to make things better, right? I mean, your system has to be, has to, has to actually work. And, and, and one of the things is sort of, you know, it, it's, it's just that it has to be fast and whether you lose features or whatnot, that's just kind of how it is. So some stats, t statistics that you should be sort of thinking about, you can look at plow.org. If you're not going as fast as plow.org, you have a problem, right? Plow.org is just a clone. Like, we're not doing anything special at all. We have, like, the normal navigation menu. If you go slower than plow.org, you your application has a big problem, right? I mean, that's, that's just a fact. Like, you need to not go slow or not terribly slow because this is slow, right? I mean, so we're, we're looking at anonymous, <laughs> anonymous taking 0 .04 seconds to render a page. This is not caching, right? This is plone. Right, so that's kind of, that's slow. It's really slow, but that's sort of where we are with Plone until we start taking out more features. Um, authentication results, you're probably about 0.1 seconds per worker. I mean, that's just, you get rid of the green bar, we could probably get down to 0.6, but that's, that's, what, that's what we have right now, right? The navigation might make it, might shave up 10% or something, but. Like these are the numbers that if your application is, is like substantially worse than this, you have a problem, right? And I guess, you know, people don't really want to say this, but that's, that's the numbers that we've sort of arrived at. Um, so like what this really kind of means is that you can only handle about 10 requests per second inside of the, the workers, right? So that's okay, you, you typically have one worker per core, you have four cores, you can do 40 requests per second and your varnish system is you know, is caching all the static assets or you use our WSGI static thing inside of our disk which will actually intercept the responses coming out and cache them on the file system. So we like serve static assets off the file system through through uh, uh, through WSGI and, and, and Zen stuff. And so like that just sort of reduces the amount of stuff that Zope has to do. But if Zope ever does anything, I mean, you're talking about, you know, that's a worker not doing some sort of computation. Now, 10 requests per second sounds really slow, and it kind of is, but you have to understand, like, that's, not, that's without any caching or without any sort of anything. That's just like the bare system out of the box, and that's actually not that bad. I mean, it used to be much worse, and, you know, I think we could probably get it to about 16 or 17, maybe 20, um, but we're going to start losing features at that point. Um, and another thing which is seem, seemingly, we run into where people like blame the ZODB for performance problems, it's not your, I can promise you it's not your performance problem. I mean, we've done a lot of benchmarking and a lot of analysis, the ZODB is simply not your problem. I mean, you can show me an application, I would love to sort of like, to, to, to look at it, and I can guarantee you it's not your problem. Now, if you're doing lots of writes, then that could, it could be your problem. But if, you're read, if, you're, if your application is reading, if it's a read-oriented application or a normal traditional CMS application, the ZODB just simply will not be your problem, period. Right, so uh, Lotus, the Chapman of Lotus Spain, to add speed, add lightness. I mean, this is just the fact, right? I mean, like, we, we, we are using an interpreted language, right? I mean, we're like, we, the only thing we can go faster is just by not doing things or doing things a little bit smarter. Uh, deeply nested graphs are a terrible idea. I mean, it's okay as, as long as you're not, like the folder structure, the, the, the folder structure shouldn't be terribly deep. Uh, 10 plus is a really bad idea. Uh, any sort of page templates have to be kept super simple. You do not do any traversal inside of, uh, in page templates. You compute everything inside your view, you push it inside the view, and the view can actually uh, uh, just render the, the built-ins. 
this sort of makes sure that security checks don't happen, the sort of traversal, you know, you sort of generate dictionaries, generate built-ins, and you push them to the page template, and the page template reads them. If you're doing anything else, you're actually like causing a, 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 a lot of performance problems in your application for no real decent reason, right? Um, another big problem that we have, I haven't been, how much time have I been talking? Well, you have about five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Uh, sorry, I forgot to put in my, my. So hiding complexity, a terrible idea. Do not hide complexity. Show the complexity, like it should be staring you in the face. If you have a really clean API that underneath the hood is actually insanely complicated, you're doing yourself a disservice, right? But what will happen is you'll have a problem, it'll look really squeaky clean, and you're like, oh, wow, what's this problem? And then you like go and look, and it's like, blam! You know, it's like massive complexity, it's doing all sorts of really terrible things, but like you like kind of hit it and glossed it over with like some sort of a fancy stuff, right? Like we're talking about performance. If things are slow, then, you know, like, However clear and clean the API is, it just doesn't matter. It's slow. It's a turd, right? Um, so uh, making performance possible and, 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 and concreteness over adaptation, I think Pyramid does a very good, it has a very, very good way of, of, uh, of, of sort of stru structuring things, right? Like on startup and on read, you can do as much complicated configuration as possible, but you never, ever, ever do any of that stuff in runtime, right? That's okay. Like we can do some pretty complicated stuff inside of in, inside of startup, right? I mean, we have Python. It's really really expressive. We have all sorts of like tooling, but you never really do any sort of adaptation things at runtime unless, like, unless you're like a core infrastructure developer doing something. Everything should be very very fast, and simple and concrete. And then of course, any of this stuff doesn't really matter if you don't have the infrastructure to kind of manage it. Continuous integration, Hudson or Jenkins or whatever. You have to use that because you have to sort of like actually like see your system build or, or see what the, the, the performance characteristics of it are over trended over time or something. And that sucks to actually have to deal with the infrastructure, but you know, that's just a that's just a fact of life, right? I mean you just have to have infrastructure if you're building very sophisticated applications or you will have you'll pay for the problem you'll pay for it, right? So either you pay up front and you're happy and you kind of like deal with it, or you at the end you pay for it and everyone's unhappy. Right? And so I mean just just come into it as an adult and, and understand, you know what, you know where you're paying your, your debt. Um, so 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 in deployment and an operation side, there's sort of like this big problem I have, and I, I might sound disparaging, and I'm sorry, but like, you know, developers think sort of more, you know, make more software. Like we're going to solve our problems with more software, and this is a really dangerous and bad thing, right? Like you you just use you use the technologies, the operational technologies that everyone has, and that's just sort of how you know how 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 you need to work um, operations because operations doesn't really care they don't really care about um, uh, they don't care about your sort of software or fancy adapters or any of that stuff. Sorry, I just want to. I feel naked without my phone. <laughs> All right, so like you, so what you do as like a grown up, right, is you package your application with like system packages, like whether it's an executable or RPM or Deb, like you're. You man up and you like just learn how the packages work and you fucking package your software for the operations guys because if you don't, then they are going to hate you, you're going to hate them, and everyone's going to be unhappy, right? So like just do it, right? Um, so like, you know, uh, well, so anyway, I don't have very much time. I can talk about continuous deployment, but if you go to package.infoldsystems.com slash docs, we have like an explanation of how to do packaging, like how we do it. And, and, it's not the best way, but it works, and we actually have like many customers using it. So then, you know, what what you do is you, once your package is tested, everyone staged it. You can actually like push it into like the repo, and then the, all the operations guy has to do is like RPM update, and bam, he has all the software there. You know, ain't the clouds part, angels sing. He's happy, right? He's like really happy. He doesn't have to like run build out or run pip or anything insane, he like just like did RPM and he's happy, right? Um, and, so, and, and so like, you know, you, you can only really, you have to use the tooling because, you know, in a software development life cycle, only 10 or 15% of the total life cycle is inside development, right? So like you're copping out if you actually think that you're doing things faster or whatever inside of development. You know, the fact is is that your precious time is not actually where the bulk of the actual project will live, 
right? The project lives many, many, many more years after you're done with it, right? So you have to do things a way that it can actually be maintained over time. Right, so another thing, if you're, wear if you're not wearing a pager, then you don't get to sort of make the rules. You know, I mean like at three in the morning when the pager goes off, if you're not the person that's being called, then you don't get to make the rules, you know? Um, and then there's all sorts of other things like, you know, you know, you have to have lots of logging, lots of error, error handling, you know, some sort of, you know, sort of uh, uh, log aggregation. You have to have all this stuff, the ability to turn off features inside the software, right? Because when it's 3 a.m. and someone calls you and the system's out or a system is performing poorly, like, you have to think within the next five minutes, like, how do you solve this remotely when someone is not actually the Python programmer on the other side? Right, and like this is just how everyone else does it as well, right? You just can't be everything to all, you know, you can't do everything. So, uh, you know, editing, you know, so could you imagine, right, like, you know, there's a government agency and they're like having a problem and they're like, hey, you know, what's going on? And you're like, well, why don't you go edit a Python file, right? Like, what? Like, you know, they put some space in there right? and it just like blows up. Like, oh, it says indentation error. Like, what? You know, like, why did you put a space in there? I didn't tell you to put a space in there. Oh, I thought it would like, look nice. Like, what? No, like, you know, I mean. So anyway, I think, I think we should sort of like, you know, pat ourselves on the back. We've like abused varnish pretty well. We like have made it do all sorts of really fun like dances and, and I don't even know why this slide's there. Why is this slide there? Uh, yeah, so if, like most likely if ZODB is your problem, it's actually not the problem. Moving to a relational database would actually be much worse. Much, much, much worse. Uh, well, that's pretty much it. I'm sorry for, uh, yeah. I'm sorry for taking uh, as much time as I, as I did. Uh, uh, if if I, I'm up for talking about anything, uh, there was other things I wanted to talk about, but I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get, get to them. So anyway, uh, is there any questions? Questions? I have a It's just a a a, uh, a binding for the Chameleon templating engine. Okay, for the Chameleon. It uses Chameleon, yeah. Okay, so the question was, what is five PT? Five PT is a a a a a, a Chameleon binding for Zoop. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the problem is that there's just competing interests and people, they're just, they, everyone has to duke it out, right? So you have like people who are like, there's an app, there's Plone the application, which is like super feature rich and everyone's, you know, like, you know, using it to sell to their manager and it does all sorts of things. And then you have the people who are actually trying to make it like work, like fast. And they're just competing. I mean, it's not like we have a company that sort of, you know, this is the direction we're gonna take or, or a bunch of R&D, it's just sort of, there's this fight. And so the only thing that, the best thing that can happen is just sort of saying, you know, this feature takes this amount of time or this amount of function calls, you know, fix it. Either fix it or drop it or raise a stink on the mailing list. And I think people are probably okay. I mean, the, 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 that's, that, that's something that, you know, everyone kind of needs to help out with pointing out like, this thing is terrible. It is a, a performance hog or it has a big problem. You know, that's. that's and, and what's the best way to fill a green bar and see that the house is Yeah, I have no idea. I mean, like, like it's, we're, we're, pretty, we're, we're pretty bearish on, on that, that side. I mean, they're redoing the entire UI in Plone 5, and that's sort of incrementally coming in Plone 4. So you can, like, pull, you can pull it in, and it gets rid of the, the entire idea of that. And it's sort of just all quite. Ajax and the only requests that are, hap that are rendering pages and it's, it's a very different beast and it should perform substantially better, right? Like substantially, like we should be able to get a ton of, you know, ton of, ton of like, 
concurrent authors working inside the system. Um, but, you know, it's sort of like maybe, I mean, it's usable. I know people that are using it in production now. So it, it works. It's just that, you know, you have to know what it's not going to do and, and set the customer's expectations or you'll get burnt. Yeah. Any more questions? Nope. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry that it took so long.